So today I'm presenting on um, a research program that we started about 12, 13 years ago in 2001 in the Mission District in San Francisco, uh, which many of you know as a place to socialize or live. It's a cultural center um, for Latinos here in San Francisco. And um, the focus of the work that we initially um, began was to really look at social and sexual networks of adolescents and how they influence reproductive health outcomes, namely pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. And we were really motivated at the time that we began this study to do the work um, to address the social inequalities that um, persist nationally and in the state of California around teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. And unfortunately, disparities that still persist today and um, motivate the work that we continue to do uh, looking at these outcomes in Latino adolescents. And doing work um, focused around Latinos in California, and there have been se several presentations today um, focused on Latino adolescents, is really critical given the demographic composition of the state. Um, and you know, in the, the coming years, it's, uh, Latino adolescents will continue to constitute a large proportion of the population, in fact, the majority. Though the work was funded to look at sexually transmitted infections and teen pregnancy, and I, my background was in reproductive health and HIV prevention, what we really came to appreciate um, in initiating the work was the role that community violence played in youth's lives, in really shaping their day-to-day -day interactions with each other in the community, and then ultimately as the work evolved, the role of community violence in reproductive health outcomes, which were constituting the focus of our work. And here is a map I've uh, carried around with me in talks for quite some time, but it still gives me pause because poignantly depicted here is one square block in the mission. This is Mission Street, 17th and, uh, 17th and 18th Streets. And we were doing an activity where we asked youth to draw their neighborhood. And what they saw is the important places, the places where they spent time, how they moved through their space. And here, this was a perspective of a 17-year-old male who was a Soreño and lived in Soreño ter territory. And what he knew was a social space that was riddled with gang tags, with people trying to claim space, uh, with liquor stores, drive-by shootings depicted here in the car, um, and a lot of really negative contextual influences. And what, it, what he commented was how sad it was that the children who lived in this neighborhood had to pass through this space to get to school to run their errands. And though there are a lot of resources, and this map comes out of more recent work that we've done with youth where they actually were de um, developing maps that were neighborhood-wide, and there are a lot of assets here, parks, community centers, uh, places where people congregate, health centers, um, schools. But what overlays on top of this and really colored uh, people's experience is the, the presence of very strongly delineated gang territories. And it really affected the youth's trajectory. So even if you're not in a gang, there's the, the, the awareness of it, the culture of violence in the community is very prominent. And young people may think about this in choosing the way that they walk to school and the clothes that they wear and ultimately the, you know, the trajectory that they have through adolescence and into adulthood. I want to say, though, that you know, most, most youth are not in a gang. And um, listening to these talks today, I kind of thought, oh, my talk is so negative. I've got, I've got all these bad outcomes. But the story is moving toward how do we learn from these and then intervene in positive ways. Um, so I, I, I promise it won't be 15 minutes of um, bad things that kids do. It's, that's just my starting point. And it's, it's actually odd, because it's something I've struggled a lot with. We're, Coco and I are starting a new project now. And often to get funding, you have to frame the risk. I mean, and that's what motivates. The, you know, the need is there. And so you go to a place where the need it is, and then you're wanting to invert that and focus on, on strengths and, um, and assets that people bring. And so um, there's kind of a, a challenge, I think, in sometimes doing both. Um, in, the, in two studies where we measured gang involvement, these were both prospective studies where we followed people over time, um, what we found is that about 10% of youth report being actually in a gang. This is predominantly among males. And the, the important piece, though, is that about 40%, and sometimes it's as high as close to 50 in our studies, the youth have close friends who are in gangs. And so, so Coco, at the outset of the day, talked about social networks. And we know the importance of social ties and influencing people's risk environment, their choices around behavior, positive outcomes that they may have. Um, and if you look in one of our more recent studies, we also attended to thinking about gang membership within people's families. And there it's well over half of the youth in our studies, um, and these are community-derived samples, um, are experiencing a close relationship with gang affiliation. So in terms of implications for uh, youth relationships, 
Um, in one of the first studies that we did, a finding that stood out among, uh, higher than other things, was really the role of having a male partner in a gang for young women, increasing their pregnancy risk by about 90%. And there were two main factors that contributed to this finding, because you know, in addition to noting that there are you know, two bad things that have come together here, um, we wanted to understand why. Um, again, thinking about, well, what can you do about it? And one of the, the things that is, remained important um, through some of the analyses that we did was the higher levels of incarceration um, among gang-involved partners, really heightening the importance of expressing intimacy in relationships. And then having a baby with an incarcerated partner is one way to achieve that. Um, and in fact, these findings are um, documented in other adult populations of women, of partners of men in, in San Quentin prison, prison as well. And then the second thing speaks to gender power imbalances. And that is that this was expressed as a male's um, partner's desire for pregnancy, exerting a strong influence on whether pregnancies actually occurred. Overall, sort of regardless of, of the uh, gang findings, um, in a study that we did with about 550 youth um, and followed for two years, we found that a quarter of the females became pregnant. And I wanted to say, too, that it's, it's important finding was that m most of these pregnancies were unintended. And so we tend to assume sometimes that um, pregnancies in teens are occurring in stable, more stable partnerships and that there's some sort of decision not to use contraception. Um, and in fact, what we found was that uh, on top of 75% of the pregnancies occurring in relationships where the female had previously said she really didn't want to become pregnant, she definitely didn't want to, um, that a lot of the pregnancies occurred in the sort of world of sexual networks in sort of complex partnership structures. So it wasn't monogamous or serial monogamous relationships, but rather um, relationships where that overlapped in time with others, one night stands. And these um, kinds of findings were reflected in the qualitative work that we've conducted as well. Um, as one young woman commented, relationships in the neighborhood are messy. Um, and here she's speaking to what we would call concurrency, that is relationships that overlap in time. Um, and they took the form of cheating, you know, having a main partner with friends with benefits on the side, overlapping partnerships in time, and you know, getting back together with partners um, through serial breakups. Particularly for males, street gangs shaped partnerships. Um, and this is a, a comment from a young man we interviewed, and he described, she told me she wanted to be more than like fringe benefits. And I told her, well, I don't really know, because those relationships, they don't be lasting. And when they do, they feel bad. He really speaks to a disinterest here and commitment to avoid emotional vulnerability, giving the emotional um, demands of street life. Another theme that stood out was the comment that young males felt they had limited time for relationships because of commitments to the gangs, first and foremost. And finally, young men described how multiple partners bring more status, with remarks such as, you have more game, you've got more reputation. But from the perspective of young women, um, there were clear, in addition to the, the finding I shared earlier around the heightened risk for pregnancy, um, street gangs definitely directly affected reproductive health risks. And this was expressed by one young woman who stated, I never had a partner who was, in a, who was a gang member, but I have seen a lot of my girlfriends who have, and they wind up pregnant or their boyfriends are in jail, and the girls are left with nothing. In addition to uh, pregnancy being adopted as a strategy to strengthen, strengthen, uh, strengthen excuse me, relationship commitment and draw the partner away from the streets, um, it was also quite often the case that alcohol, as part of the way that people socialize, um, influenced uh, whether condoms were used. So I mean, here we've been focusing to, so far on violence within the context of relationships, but a, a more structural influence of violence is really important to note as well. And that is uh, the effect of, ha of living in a place with community of violence, um, affecting the capacity to adopt preventative behaviors. Um, there's pervasive knowledge of community violence and the exposure to trauma related to that. Uh, it's walking down the street and seeing visible altars, such as this one set up for young people. Um, I can't tell you how often you walk into a community center at, and children are there to play basketball or to get after school tutoring, but they walk past a table with photographs and candles and other memorabilia from other young people in their immediate environment who have uh, lost their lives to violence. And um, the, 
the issue, too, that I don't have time to get into today that I just want to mention is that you know, the community violence is a strong influence here in the mission, but overlaid on top of that are also social disparities tied to immigration and um, other changes, economic changes within the neighborhood that you know, sort of both d drive the violence but also sort of perpetuate in a sense that youth don't see alternatives um, for their future. So our, you know, our work here was really to do this and then think about um, how we can move toward interventions. And what can we learn then from you know, this kind of research and about the people who have successful outcomes? And I kept thinking um, in preparing some notes for this talk about a sort of constructed participant or a young person I met whose name I'll give Fernando. I met him 12 years ago when he was just about to graduate from Mission High School. Um, he had immigrated with his family to the mission when he was in elementary school and moved to a block um, where nearly all the households were Latino, families who were similar to his own. Uh, he participated in an after-school tutoring program in middle school that provided mentorship that proved very pivotal to his success and really kept him engaged in high school and um, with goals for post-secondary education. He successfully avoided the pool of gangs and demonstrated his decision not to affiliate by wearing only neutral colors. I mean, he dressed from head to toe in light gray and white. He, like many youth in our studies, expressed high educational aspirations and wanted to complete his BA. He started at San Francisco City College, yet had difficulty completing his course load and never made the transition to San Francisco State that he had hoped to make. Part of this was due to him needing to support his family through the work that he was doing at 18. Um, his, his own income supplemented his parents' earnings. And during this time, he was acutely aware of economic changes in the community um, and described how his family became one of the very last Latino families on his block during um, the time that I knew him. Though he, it's sort of a mixed story because though he didn't achieve his educational goals, he did gain strong community development training and went on to work doing gang prevention and intervention work, which he's still doing today, and had his first child at 30 um, in a, uh, with a person he'd known for some time and who he was married to. Um, so building on the findings of our mixed methods work and recalling stories like Fernando's, we designed an intervention um, that focused on building future opportunities for youth by engaging youth within their social network of close friends. The intervention we called Yo Puedo, and this is our recruitment flyer, and both Will, um, Dow, and I was pointing to you, Coco, you're indirectly involved, um, not a, an honorary member of the team. Um, but Will is a co-investigator on the study. Um, it, we were focused here on countering two dominant pathways to adulthood um, that were so pervasive through the other work we'd done, and uh, both gang involvement and early childbearing. And the goal was to promote educational attainment and reproductive health wellness. Um, this slide is a slightly longer version of Yo Puedo, so just kind of cut it at the six uh, month mark. But essentially, this is what the intervention looked like. The first two months of the intervention um, focused on goal setting related to education, job training, and reproductive health wellness, as well as life skills workshops. And youth attended weekly life skills sessions over an eight week period. And then during the six month um, time frame of the intervention, youth could earn up to $200 for completing goals that they themselves set. One of the themes of the life skills was self-advocacy, and so youth thought a lot about how they can become their own best agents for change and really mobilize within their social networks to achieve that. Here's one, of, one guy's poster that he proposed. Um, and just a, a note on um, some of the effects. We were interested, in addition to a lot of feasibility questions at this stage, we were interested in looking at effects on people's social environments. Could we change the environment in which, or would the intervention have an effect on how people spent time? And then also on individual behaviors. And um, uh, in an interview conducted with several, uh, with a social network of young women who had participated, they said, summed it up by saying, we keep each other from getting knock, locked up and knocked up. And this was also echoed in the quantitative data where we saw a 50% reduction in frequent time spent hanging out on the street. And individual behaviors, we saw reductions in alcohol and marijuana use. Um, in the main analyses, they weren't significant, but when we look at youth who participated um, with sort of a modest level of, of engagement or more, um, that th those became significant associations. So here, um, one of the lessons that we learned through this work is that addressing opportunities for youth um, you know, building a future does offer multiple pathways to adulthood, but that we have to engage other sectors out of pub out beyond public health, which is um, 
something that's been a theme today. So to this end, we've partnered with some education researchers to seek funding for um, Yo Puedo to take it to the next step. This, um, I wanted to sort of end with this health impact pyramid because it really, for me, is another visual depiction of some of the comments that we've um, had in presentations earlier today. And this is, um, was in an article several years back by the head of CDC. And it really, most of the work in sexual and reproductive health has focused on you know, these top two dimensions of the, of the pyramid. That is a lot of focus on counseling and education and clinical interventions. Um, and while these are critically important, you know, we can, and you can have innovation in those areas. You can do partner-delivered therapy for treatment of sexually transmitted infections. Um, we still, those kinds of interventions require a lot of individual effort to achieve population impact. And so as we move down to long-lasting protective interventions or changing the context to make individuals' default decisions healthy, um, we are doing more to engage and think about the social environment. So I'll end um, here with a slide on a study that we're just starting in Salinas to examine factors that underlie both youth violence and teen pregnancy. And whereas much of the work that I've done has been based in urban areas, there's been relatively little attention to rural agricultural-based communities. And even though the city of Salinas is um, you know, a relatively an urbanized area, the influences in people's environments are, are quite distinct from those that you might see in an urban setting. And so we're looking to really focus this work around protective factors to engage youth. And this has been an interesting discussion for me because I think some of the questions we have are what are the best ways to engage youth when you're doing a big research study like this to ensure that we have promising intervention directions um, at the end of it. So thank you. <laughs>